Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Transcriptome Analysis, presented by Dr. Mark Gerstein, Albert L. William Professor of Biomedical Informatics and co-director of the Yale Computational Biology and Bioinformatics Program at Yale University. I am Marjorie Torres of Labbers, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots. Labroots is a leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want and any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the green icon located on the lower left. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing educational credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Gerstein. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Uh, hello, uh, so I'll, I'll begin now. Um, uh, I'd like to talk today uh, about transcriptome analysis. And I'm going to talk about um, kind of core issues uh, related to transcriptome analysis, particularly uh, getting it uh, gene regulation. And I'm also going to talk about some things that come about when you do uh, large-scale transcriptome analysis and you sort of uh, study the, that activity itself, the, the data exhaust of um, people mining the transcriptome. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So it's kind of a sort of meta uh, an analysis. So first of all, I thought I would just give you a sense of um, what you study when you study the uh, transcriptome. Um, as uh, you all know, um, uh, RNA transcription uh, comes about from a sort of fundamental process of um, weeding out uh, what's in genes, and this, of course, is a result of um, RNA polymerase um, producing a transcript, and uh, the transcripts are usually thought to be either um, protein coding um, uh, transcripts that are going to uh, form uh, protein coding uh, genes or things related to um, non coding RNAs. And um, people, um, uh, I should say, uh, take the uh, transcripts from these things and uh, cut them up into uh, little pieces and then um, sequence them in next gen sequencing uh, machines to get a sense of which transcripts are present in uh, different types of cells and cells in different states. And um, they also can get a sense of how many there are of a particular transcript, and this gives them a kind of a readout of the activity of different genes. Um, now, and the, this readout, it, people usually uh, refer to this whole process as kind of um, doing an RNA-seq experiment, um, which is the sort of center, exper central experiment in uh, transcriptomics. And I thought I would just kind of quickly tell you kind of what you get in one of these experiments. I mean, the sort of basic uh, thing you get in the experiment is huge numbers of sequence reads. And so these are the little um, snippets of sequence, and they occupy, um, you know, maybe a, a number of gigabytes, depending on how big your um, experiment is. And uh, people then tend to um, take each of these reads and sort of map it back uh, to the genome. And uh, usually that, of course, um, sort of reduces the um, size of the data files you know, by a, a, a factor, and I've kind of shown this. And then by looking at um, how high the stack of aligned reads is at any given base, they can form uh, kind of what's called a signal track, which is just you know, how many um, RNA-seq reads are um, uh, aligned at a given uh, spot in the genome. And then the final thing they do is they tend to, say, average uh, the amount of um, sort of reads over a given location, say over a, a, an exon. 
to get a level of gene expression or exon expression and so forth. And that's the sort of final um, output of one of these experiments. And of course, as we uh, move down this process, we're kind of reducing the data and we're um, talking about smaller and smaller um, amounts of information. So we start off with, you know, literally um, files that have um, billions of uh, bits where they have all these reads. And at the end, you know, we might end up with a vector of just 20,000 numbers that represent the level of the uh, 20,000 canonical genes uh, with which they're on and off. And that sort of represents um, a processing of the experiment. So now, what, when we think about kind of trying to um, analyze these experiments, I, I have this uh, metaphor of kind of looking at activity patterns. And, uh, you know, the, what you should see in the slide now is this kind of picture, a sort of um, time-lapse picture of a bunch of skyscrapers. And you can see the lights kind of going on and off, and you can think of each um, window as sort of a gene. And you're, um, you know, uh, at one second you're doing a transcriptome experiment, you're seeing how much each gene is on, or in this metaphor, how much uh, how much illumination you have in each uh, window of the building. And then you're watching this um, over time, and you know, windows are going on and off, and you're sort of seeing the uh, kind of activity of the cell um, and, and, and so forth. And what that, that's what we kind of observe if we do a number of transcriptome experiments. And the goal in the kind of analysis to kind of infer what's going on in the roots. You know, how are all these lights that are going on and off, how are they regulated, how are they controlled? Um, you know, what's the inner structure that's uh, controlling them? And, you know, it's very much like sort of peering out at the city and you're looking at these buildings and suddenly a whole floor of lights goes on or, you know, um, one, you know, a, a two lights in two different parts of the building kind of go on at the same time. You're kind of thinking to yourself, geez, you know, what's going on? Are they having a, you know, a conference on that floor? Or are the two people leaving the office at the same time? Or what, what does this mean? And, and it's the sort of same uh, idea when we're kind of peering at the um, cell and we're trying to understand, um, you know, why are these genes going on and off together, um, uh, you know, in this biological process. So that's the sort of overall thing that we're doing in RNA-seq analysis. And, you know, there's sort of some kind of basic questions we're sort of thinking about. You know, we, we often um, look at these activity patterns kind of a, across um, different times and all, or sort of different sets of samples. And so one thing we can, of course, look at is uh, as an organism develops, you know, we can see uh, the organism developing from, say, the embryo to the larva to an adult. You know, what pattern, what genes kind of go on and off together in development. Um, we can also take maybe the same adult cell in um, different organisms uh, but that we know were related, and we can see if those organisms have uh, similar genes on and off and so forth. You know, if we take um, cells from the brain, for instance, and say a human, a mouse, and a chimpanzee are similar genes on and off and so forth. Um, we can, of course, ask um, if we look at um, people getting a disease, um, you know, for instance, someone getting uh, cancer, and we compare it to normal, we can see, again, how do the, how do the activity patterns change? Are there certain genes that go on when you um, get uh, a particular disease, or the certain genes that go off, and so forth? And then also we can look at individual variation. We can see um, if we just take, um, let's say, the sample of someone's blood, over many individuals, we can see tiny uh, changes in uh, genes kind of going up and down that represent really the same type of cell in an adult, but it's really varying across uh, different people. And the idea here is that that's kind of the um, variation that you see between individuals and is somehow related to their underlying um, genomic differences. So those are some of the different types of variation we can see in these experiments. Now, th that's the kind of core analysis we're trying to do um, in an, uh, one of these experiments. But there's also this idea that when we're doing um, a sort of large-scale um, uh, analysis of this data, sometimes we kind of can see other things. And we I, people often use this term data exhaust to describe it. So we're doing an activity, like there's a consortium that's collecting a lot of information about um, transcriptomes and so forth. And we can actually study that activity itself, the activity of collecting all that data and what it says about the consortium. Or what we're going to also talk about is how 
when we're collecting the, all these um, DNA sequence reads, say, related to cancer or related to certain cell types, we actually um, inadvertently reveal a lot about the underlying uh, subject or person uh, being studied. And again, that's a, an aspect of this kind of um, inadvertent data collection, the exhaust of the process. And we'll talk about that uh, too. So now uh, what you see is a kind of outline for this talk. And so first we're going to talk about the kind of core things that happen in transcriptome analysis and, you know, mining the activity of the genes. So we're going to talk about, you know, how we cluster them together, how we can kind of build models uh, that talk about uh, which genes tend to work together and how they're controlled. And then we finally talk about trying to simplify those models into kind of a very um, circuit-like or logic gate type of um, description of um, the transcriptome. And that's the kind of core analysis of RNA-seq. But then I'm going to sort of talk about, well, you know, if people are doing these RNA-seq experiments on lots of people, there's also this issue that, you know, we're getting reads um, and levels of gene expression from lots of, of individuals, and actually there's a, a serious privacy concern. I'm going to talk about uh, those concerns and, and how we um, sort of think about them, um, and in particular how we can um, think about anonymizing the RNA-seq uh, data sets and so forth. And then I'm also going to finally talk a little bit about this, um, uh, more about this sort of data exhaust issues and this idea that, well, actually if we look at these um, big groups of people that generate all this data, they, um, you know, they generate a lot of papers, they work together, they have a kind of activity pattern, and that activity pattern in itself is also interesting to study. And we can see some interesting um, uh, relationships between people and how uh, data sets are disseminated. Um, so we'll talk about that at the end. Um, so now let's go on to the, the first of the three topics, which is really the, the um, core uh, gene expression analysis. So first we're going to focus on a sort of very basic science thing. We're going to look at gene expression and development. And uh, we're going to look at uh, gene expression data developed uh, from the ENCODE project. And so the ENCODE project uh, is this big uh, genome annotation project. It's mostly focused on the um, annotating the human genome. But they've also uh, developed a lot of uh, functional genomics data sets for uh, model organisms, such as the uh, worm, the fly, and also the mouse. And we, you know, the consortium has tried to kind of put them together a little bit in register with the uh, human data. And uh, one of the nice things about model organisms, of course, is we can um, look at um, the uh, gene expression um, throughout the life stage, you know, in the embryo as the organism develops. And, you know, we can't do that so easily uh, for a human. And that gives us really a sense of, um, you know, certain genes that may be important in very early life stage that we don't see in the adult. And the nice thing also of looking at multiple model organisms, we can, of course, compare them. And so we have these really nice uh, data sets for the worm and the fly that are sort of diagrammed to some degree in these circles here that sort of look at the entire development from the embryo to the larva. Uh, and then in the fly, there's this additional stage called the pupa, and you end up with the adult. And we have um, these... Uh, data sets there, they have roughly about 30 some odd stages for both the worm and the fly, and uh, you know, they're collected over the development. And there's also lots of um, additional data sets, they have data sets in, um, for the human, now these aren't over development, but some of them we can also kind of put in register with the worm and the fly data sets, so we're going to be talking about that. So the first thing we might want to do, um, kind of uh, analytically, is we might want to ask which genes um, kind of go on and off together in development. You know, maybe there's some genes that come on early and then they go off later on together and so forth. And this is the kind of canonical uh, problem of gene expression clustering. This was originally uh, tackled about uh, 20 years ago when people started doing uh, gene expression experiments. And there's been many um, algorithms people have developed for uh, clustering gene expression. There's all sorts of uh, ways of doing it from the sort of simple hyperbolic clustering, or they have dimensionality uh, reduction algorithms, and all sorts of things. But one of the things that um, uh, we've started to think about is, well, we're actually interested in doing clustering in a number of different organisms. We'd like to kind of cluster the gene expression in the human, but we'd also like to do it in the worm and the fly, and we'd like to cluster them all together. Maybe there's a way of doing the clustering so that it's kind of self-consistent. And so, to do that, we've 
use this idea that um, there's often this concept of orthologous genes that are essentially the equivalent genes between two species. Um, and we want to kind of cluster the two, um, say, two organisms so that their orthologous genes kind of get placed in a um, similar way into clusters. And we developed an algorithm we called OrthoClust to do, to do this. And this algorithm develops these cross-species uh, modules of gene expression. And the algorithm uses this concept of network uh, modularity. And you know, I have a kind of complicated uh, formula here. But what the formula is going to measure is how well uh, you cluster two things. So let, let me explain uh, that concept. So if you look at the top, there's uh, two kind of networks. There's um, uh, the dolphin social network and the political books uh, network. And they are, the, the nodes are colored, um, you know, uh, two different colors in each network. And you, know, you can sort of see in the dolphin network that coloring is, it makes more sense. You know, there's sort of two groups, and they're really not connected that well. Whereas in the uh, one on the, the political books network, that even though we've colored things two different colors, they're less separated. And so we can measure this degree to which the labeling and the clustering really reflects two uh, true um, uh, separateness between things by using this uh, concept of network modularity. And this was a concept that was introduced by Newman a few years ago. And basically, uh, what you do in this thing is you um, compare it for um, a given um, cluster, which is something that would be colored a certain thing. You compare uh, how many um, connections there are um, between um, uh, things in the same module with the number that you expect uh, from random chance. And so that's the um, uh, that that's the number of things that you um, uh, that are connected are in the adjacency matrix, and the number expected are in this uh, term that has k i um, k sub i k sub j over two m. And if they're in the um, same module or not, you um, uh, count them if they're if, if based on this uh, delta function. And so this just kind of shows you if you uh, sort of label your nodes in a way that doesn't really reflect the underlying modularity, you'll get um, a very low value for this quantity. Whereas if you label your nodes uh, here in a way that really does reflect the, the underlying structure, you'll get a very uh, high value or maximal value for the um, uh, modularity. And so what you might want to do uh, in clustering is you might want to try to uh, maximize that modularity. You might want to color your nodes uh, in such a way as to maximize it. And that, of course, would give you an optimal clustering, say, one species. And um, what we introduced is this notion of um, doing this clustering problem simultaneously in two different species. And we demand that the um, labels are consistently colored in the two different species if the two, if two genes are orthologous. And so we add, so we, we maximize the modularity in, say, organism A. We maximize the modularity in organism B. But the key thing is we also um, add in the uh, third term that we uh, provide a reward if the coloring, essentially, or the, the clustering is the same in the two different um, organisms. And that's that sort of third term uh, in, the, in the sum. And, and so with that, we can develop this notion of um, things that clusters that you just have in one species, clusters that you have in the other species. But the key thing is you have clusters that are really consistently labeled in both species. Um, now, you can uh, do this. And you can uh, cluster any number of species. And here I actually show a clustering that we developed a number of years ago for uh, human, worm, and fly. And so you can see on this picture, um, there are some um, groups of uh, genes that um, you, you can see they cluster together, say, for instance, um, just in worm. That would be, say, the pentagonal um, group. Um, or they may be, uh, say, clustered together in um, worm and fly, and that's the star group. But then you can see there's groups that they're, they're connected in um, worm, fly, and human, and that's the circle group. And those are um, these kind of very conserved modules. And overall, we found 16 conserved modules that represent genes that tend to go on and off together in a consistent fashion in um, human, worm, and fly. And these are organisms that are separated by hundreds of millions of years of um, history, 
but they represent some very ancient um, patterns of uh, gene expression. And one of the things that we found was that a lot of these uh, modules uh, that represent these ancient patterns, they have a particular uh, type of gene expression called the uh, hourglass behavior, uh, which people think is very important in development, uh, where they um, have a very constrained gene expression uh, during a period of um, embryogenesis. And so we felt that these, um, these modules uh, represent very ancient developmental programs uh, for genes, and we, you know, we thought these modules were important uh, in that way. Okay, so now I'm going to go on to the next um, section, state space models. So, so, so we have this notion that we've introduced of having these two different species. We have this notion of these um, gene expression clusters in um, each species. And then we have the notion of, uh, for many of the genes, they have this morphologous relationship between the two species. And some genes, however, we have a, uh, this idea that they may be not orthogonal. They're somehow species specific. And if we look at one of our kind of conserved clusters, we might want to ask, can you think of the dynamics of the, go the up and down of these genes or the activity of these genes as being controlled just within the uh, conserved module, or do you have to evoke some um, uh, genes that are species specific to can, um, to uh, describe that. And so to, to answer that question, we uh, sort of use this kind of formalism of kind of a state-space model. And so we have this notion of our internal group of genes. We have the notion of somehow um, for the uh, gene expression level of one gene, it could be related to the gene expression levels of many of the genes in the internal group, but we also have the external group. And we, we can ask to what degree do we need to invoke that external group to explain the gene expression of the internal group. And it, it's sort of very much like if you think about like a, a dynamical system, like a spring system, you can talk about the dynamics of that system internally to the spring, or you can kind of evoke this notion of some sort of external force or a driving force that um, affects the uh, dynamics of the, um, of the system. So um, how do we uh, mathematically uh, actually carry out this state space modeling? Well, the way we do it is we describe the state of um, a cell or the state of a system as a vector uh, we call x. And the vector has um, all the genes in, say, the internal group. And that's that um, sort of um, green um, column vector that we describe as x of t. And that's the state of the level of gene expression of all of the genes. And so we can think of the internal dynamics as um, the, that state uh, x of t evolving to x of t plus 1. And the one way of thinking about that evolution is to think about the um, levels of x of t of 1 of somehow being some linear combination of all the levels of x of t. And that describes, in an abstract way, um, uh, all the genes within the internal group determining the pattern at the next stage. And if you had a, a, a system that was uh, purely driven by internal dynamics, that's all you would need. But you could also think that the levels of x of t plus 1 also depend on external con uh, factors. And we uh, denote that as u sub t. And, um, though, and we can think of the coupling between the external factors and um, x of t as being through this, uh, what's called the B matrix, um, which ca uh, uh, captures uh, the coupling between u, u sub t and uh, x uh, sub t plus 1. And so we can write this in um, a sort of canonical uh, sort of state space type of thing where we can write it as matrices, you know, x of t plus 1 is a x of t plus b u of t. Now, in theory, we can figure out all the parameters for this matrix A. If we had an infinite number of gene expression measurements and so forth, we could do this, but in truth, we don't have enough um, data points to determine all those um, parameters. Uh, and so one of the things we realized that we could do, though, is we could um, reduce the dimensionality of the system. And to reduce the dimensionality of the system, what we did is we took um, the matrix A and we um, sort of ran a singular value decomposition or dimensionality reduction and just um, re-expressed it in terms of its uh, main kind of um, uh, 
should say, principal coordinates, uh, you know, just sort of took the five um, leading um, eigenvectors of that uh, matrix. And now what we can do is we can express each gene um, in X of T on the projection onto those five um, uh, vectors. And that gives us a kind of reduced dimensionality um, uh, picture of the system. And, now, and we describe the reduced dimensionality um, uh, picture of the system as X hat, or X uh, a a tilde of T. So now if X of T was 5,000 genes, uh, X uh, tilde of T might be uh, five. You know, there might be only five metagenes, okay, uh, that describe the main um, types of genes going up and down. And now we, of course, uh, have uh, reduce the number of parameters in our system dramatically, and we can try to get at um, trying to determine the values of the A matrix and the B matrix. Um, now, to do that, uh, what we do is we diagonalize the um, A matrix, and we uh, describe the, uh, the, um, the A matrix as of sort of um, in terms of what's called internal dynamic pattern, we call IPDP. I'm sorry, IPDP, um, where um, lambda of uh, P is the pth um, eigenvalue of A. So we we we, we describe um, the uh, dynamics of the um, the A matrix in terms of uh, a kind of. Um, time exponential of these things. So see, the, these patterns have kind of characteristic uh, things. They tend to rise, they tend to fall, they tend to oscillate, and they represent kind of canonical uh, dynamical behaviors of this uh, matrix. So, so now uh, we can uh, kind of describe an overall uh, workflow where we start off with our uh, gene expression system. We have our internal uh, genes, they have connections, we have our external drivers. We describe them in these matrices. We reduce the matrices now to these metagenes. Now we have a smaller number of variables. And we have our, um, uh, the metagenes have an internal uh, dynamics, and they also have an external dynamics uh, in this reduced uh, space. Then what we do is we figure out our um, uh, in, uh, um, IPDPs, our internal dynamic patterns. We can also figure out our um, EPDPs, external um, uh, patterns in this uh, reduced dimensionality space. And then finally, we reproject these back into the higher space, and we describe each uh, of our original genes in, as some linear combination of these um, uh, internal dynamic patterns. And so now let me, uh, so, so you might say, well, what's the point of this? And, and you, it, I, I think the point of it, you can sort of see a little bit more when you get the results. So if we um, take the worm uh, developmental time course and the fly developmental time course, we can um, take the, um, the, you know, the orthologous genes that are common to the worm and fly. We can um, determine the um, uh, metagenes uh, related to each of those. So we can figure out the internal uh, dynamic patterns uh, associated with them. That's what's shown in the left-hand side of the figure. And you can see that there's sort of four leading internal dynamic patterns. One is kind of a, a sort of flat and then starts to oscillate more. One is a fall, one is a rise, and one is a consistent oscillation. And one thing that's really amazing uh, is that you can see that the internal dynamic patterns for both the worm and fly development are very similar. They're extremely similar. The four top ones are not the same, but they're fairly similar. Now we can do the same thing for the external patterns, and you can see the external patterns bear very little relationship between the worm and the fly. And what's amazing is that these uh, internal patterns are developed um, in isolation of each other. We don't uh, inform the uh, worm patterns by the fly patterns or vice versa, yet they, at the end, look very similar. And what's also shown in the next figure is if I just simply took, if I showed you the top five leading metagene patterns, for the, uh, the worm and the fly. That's what I show now uh, in the uh, green boxes in this figure. You can see they have very little relationship to each other. I mean, there's some similarity, but not, not that much um, relationship between each other. And you can see how the internal dynamic patterns 
are much more similar. So somehow they capture a, um, an, a, a truly ancient um, mode of um, activity that you don't see when you directly look at the patterns. Um, now then the next thing we can do is we can say for, et, for any given gene in the worm and the fly, what's its projection onto one of these uh, canonical patterns. And so, um, and we can ask for a given gene um, in the worm and the fly, does it have a similar uh, projection onto the two, um, uh, onto these patterns? And one thing you can see is that there's a tremendous correlation between um, the worm and the fly uh, genes. The orthologous genes tend to have fairly similar, fairly correlated uh, projections onto these patterns with fairly high uh, correlation coefficients. And then what you can also see is that the um, projections are um, considerably higher for, you'd think, ancient conserved genes like ribosomal genes versus younger and um, more diverse genes such as genes related to uh, signaling and so forth. And that sort of makes sense. And you get this picture of these very ancient genes um, really having dynamics that are very close related to these um, ancient patterns, these IPDPs, um, and whereas the younger genes have uh, somewhat different uh, patterns that are more related to this internal coupling. Okay, so that was discussing uh, state-space models. And now we're going to talk a little bit about logic games. And so now what we want to do here is we want to sort of try to see, we've, we've talked about um, looking at the dynamics, uh, we've developing these clusters, these ancient clusters of gene expression, and we've talked about how we can think about looking at the uh, dynamics of them you know, in terms of these uh, sort of highly uh, conserved patterns. And now what we want to do is think a little bit more about their control. And, you know, think about if we can describe their control in a kind of canonical way. So here we're going to talk about um, describing the control in terms of uh, logic gates. And so first I want to introduce the notion of uh, logic gates. And then um, I want to talk about how we can apply these uh, logic gates. So a logic gate uh, is shown in the top left-hand uh, uh, figures. Now, if you have two explicitly known regulators of the gene, so for instance, these might come from a chip-seek experiment or something where you, you say, you posit that these uh, two factors, RF1 and RF2, regulate the target T, uh, a logic gate would be, well, if, two, if the two regulators are on, for instance, do I see the target gene is on? Okay, so for instance, if, if you had an OR gate, a regulator might, one regulator might be on, the other might be off, and you see the target is on. If you had an AND gate, you'd have to demand that both regulators are on for the target to be on. And so that would be kind of a kind of canonical kind of circuit picture of regulation. And, you know, people are to some degree fairly comfortable with this type of picture. This is a very electrical circuit type of view. And so what we want to do is see to the degree to which we look at the gene expression patterns of the regulators going on and off, and then the targets going on off, do they fit into these um, very um, understandable logic gate type of uh, pictures? So we developed this uh, procedure we call low regic for um, fitting um, patterns of gene expression um, to logic gates. And uh, what you're supposed to see uh, in this figure is kind of how we do this fitting. So, you, so you, let's just look at the top, the grid at the top. And what you see there is you see a target gene, that's the bottom uh, row of the grid, and then you see two uh, things that we posit as regulators, that we call TF1 and TF2 for two transcription factors. And then you see their values, their binarized values over 20 samples. You know, so for instance, in the first thing, you see they're all off, and the second one that's uh, surrounded by a green box, you see off, on, off, and then the third one, you see on, off, off. And what your... Um, you're asked to see is if you look at those patterns, like again, the lights in the uh, buildings going on and off, do those patterns tend to fit any of the patterns you expect for a logical gate, okay? And so uh, essentially what the uh, figure shows is we essentially fit the observed patterns to um, one of the canonical logical gates. I mean, there's a kind of canonical truth table there's um, uh, for any of these gates that says, well, that looks at all the possible um, input-output uh, combinations. And we ask how consistent the gene expression is with one of these truth tables. So for instance, at the bottom, 
you see the truth table for the AND gate, and we can see this particular thing has a certain consistency with the AND gate using uh, Laplace's rule of succession. And we can see that for these two factors um, and this target gene, they mostly follow the AND gate logic. So then what we can do is we can take um, our model, one of our model organism um, uh, gene expression patterns, and we can see what type of gates are often used in that. And now we've done this uh, for the worm and fly, but I'm actually going to talk about another model organism that's even simpler, uh, the ye yeast. Um, and so what we do in uh, using a, the yeast um, uh, cell cycle, which is a very simple uh, type of um, gene expression, we have many potential triplets between regulators and targets, uh, many gene expression points measured over this the cell uh, cycling around, and we can see uh, for any given triplet which gate does it fit. You know, for instance, if you look at the first um, row we have here, we have two potential regulator genes, one target, and we have a gate that it tends to match. And so we can ask, well, what gates do you tend to find a lot? Do you find a lot of N gates? Do you find a lot of OR gates and so forth? And one of the things that's interesting is we find a lot of gates um, related to the cell cycle that seem to be like AND-like gates. And so that, that means that, that for a target gene to go on, we usually require some notion of both of the regulators to be on. Okay. Now, what I'm going to now do is show how we've taken this, um, this idea that we developed in model organisms, um, but we're now going to use this idea to talk about how we can think about disease data sets, which of course is our um, core idea. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of compare what we found um, in the human context to um, what we find in a um, uh, cancer context. So, so there's a tremendous amount of um, sort of uh, cancer gene expression da um, data. And uh, I'm going to look at a particular data set for people who have blood cancer, acute leukemia. And we'll, in this context, we have, you know, maybe 200 different patients, and we're looking at which genes go kind of on and off in these different patients. Uh, and we have a certain number of known regulatory relationships. Um, and one of the things that's really just immediately you see when you do this is you get a very different type of picture of what gates tend to be used here, as opposed to having AND gates, you have a preponderance of OR gates um, being used in the um, uh, leukemia example. And what's really interesting is um, if I um, kind of zoom in and I say I'm only going to look at um, the, uh, the gates that are, have one of the factors, uh, the, say the first uh, transcription factor is MYC. Now MYC is a very well-known um, uh, regulator that's associated with cancer, and it you know people have written a lot about it in the past, and it's you know for instance I have a little uh, quotation from a paper that that MYC is this universal amplifier, um, and so we, what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the gates that involve MYC, and what we see when we do that is that um, that not only do they tend to be um, or like gates or gates where MYC completely determines the gene expression. I mean, it's just gates determined by the value of RF1. The pattern is even more intensified uh, relative to what we saw in cancer in general. So you really see this picture of dysregulation of cancer. So in the cell cycle, we saw this picture of how we had to have genes on together to regulate the cell cycle. And in cancer, we saw, well, it's not really like that. If one regular is on, it just turns the gene on regardless of the other regular. And that is particularly the case for um, uh, uh, gates involving MYC, which is a, a, a transcription factor that's very associated with the dysregulation of cancer. So you can see this um, kind of altered um, uh, regulatory circuit usage in cancer. Okay, so let's keep going on. So now what we've talked about in the most beginning of the talk is we've talked about this kind of canonical problem of um, how we uh, analyze activity patterns. So we've talked about, well, we can look at the activity patterns of model organisms, and we can get a sense of how they work, and cluster them, and look at the gates. And then we can see, to some degree, how um, we can see different patterns in a disease state. And that's the kind of core thing we want to do with um, RNA-seq analysis. But what I'm going to talk about now is this kind of data exhaust issue. I'm going to talk about this idea that um, uh, 
actually, um, we're interested in general conclusions that we get from looking at these um, data sets. But actually, of course, particularly when we're in the opportunity in the human context, we're getting a lot of information, <clears throat> not uh, about things in general, but about specific people. And um, is there a way of um, finding the specific, the, the general conclusions without revealing too much about the patient uh, data? <clears throat> Um, this makes this um, gene expression data particularly uh, tricky from a uh, privacy perspective because we want to get general conclusions um, from data on specific individuals. And you know, can we do this without compromising their uh, privacy? And I, I just want to say a little bit about uh, genomic privacy. Um, you know, this is kind of a big um, issue uh, that people are uh, talking about. You know, there's this notion that the genome is this very um, fundamental uh, type of data related to people. And, um, you know, there's sort of um, th this idea also that it's passed on uh, through many uh, generations. So if you have a privacy breach of a person or a leak um, of data, now it potentially is very impactful in the future. And there's also this idea that we don't really know uh, that much about um, the, maybe the genome now, but in the future maybe we'll know a lot more. So there's this idea that we have to be very careful about this, which makes a lot of sense. And there's also this notion that, um, you know, we have to be particularly careful with this data because, you know, there's a lot of um, situations where things in genetics have been used in a very challenged fashion. I think one of the more recent examples of this is what happened with the HeLa cell line uh, that was uh, very controversial. And, you know, we can reflect if this sort of um, data sharing uh, versus privacy concern is similar to what we get in other contexts. You, you know, in a sense, one of the um, triumphs of, um, you know, uh, large-scale data and data science, big data, is how we can aggregate the data over many individuals and get really useful things. Uh, you know, your Google web search works so well because Google aggregates the results of many um, web searches over, you know, millions of individuals, and uh, they can figure out, you know, how those individuals are answering uh, search queries or clicking on search queries in aggregate, and that um, gives them, uh, how should I say, a way of um, providing the answer to any individual person. That's better than if they just study that uh, particular person. But of course, there's this whole issue of, um, you know, compromising the privacy of the individual people that are using the thing. So there's a similar issue. But it maybe it's a little different because we're dealing with genomic information and not, you know, just web logs or something. And there's also this notion that um, obviously we have to share uh, data to um, speed medical research, to help um, medical research. And, you know, a lot of the restrictions on data sharing and uh, data mining tend to um, encumber research, and they also make research uh, less uh, reproducible. And so we kind of have this, these two sides of this coin, this sort of, dilemma that we tend to have in modern research where, you know, we have the notion that we pool a lot of data together, we can do this uh, fancy mining that I was showing in terms of clustering it and um, analyzing and doing all sorts of things, but we potentially compromise the individual's uh, privacy. So we want to think about how we balance these uh, two things. And one of the key elements in the balancing is this notion that it's not a black and white thing. And, you know, obviously if you look at a person and you look at their eye color, you're getting a tiny bit of um, genetic information, you're getting a little associated with their eye color. Um, and people are, you know, you, we can't hide all of our genetic information, yet the notion of people having all of their variants available on the web is maybe a little extreme. So we want to have some notion of how much information is leaked when we do various uh, calculations, when we share various data sets. Um, so, there's sort of different um, modes of uh, doing this currently. I mean, the current, current mode of um, to, um, dealing with uh, a lot of large-scale data is this notion of kind of encrypting the data, having consent to use it, um, and uh, sort of locking the data up, um, you know, on uh, the computer that you're using. A lot of these schemes get hacked, and they're very cumbersome and so forth. And the alternative, of course, is that all the data should be public, um, you know, and I think that there's a lot of people who sort of say, well, you know, privacy is not a, uh, is, is not meaningful, you know, maybe going into the future, and that 
is such a cumbersome thing and people are happy to share information. And this is a good idea, but it's not clear this is going to scale to very large um, cohorts, groups of people, and so forth. Uh, and so in any case, we, what, what we've been thinking about is that one of the key things you need to do um, to move forward in the future is to really kind of develop ways of quantifying the information leakage in these firms and kind of quantifying uh, what's going on. I'm going to be talking about that uh, now. So I'm going to, to do that, I'm going to use another gene expression data set. This is called the Giovanni's data set. And this data set is important because unlike the other data sets, <coughs> it's essentially just the, um, a similar gene expression data set over, over about 500 individuals, just 500 individuals' blood gene expression. And we can look at the genes going up and down, and we can relate them to the variants in these people. And that's, of course, the information we're trying to um, protect. And the relationship between the variants and the gene expression levels is called an EQTF. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, that uh, aspect here. Uh, and so first of all, I wanted to just introduce the notion of an EQTL. Uh, that's uh, shown in this uh, figure, where you know the, uh, the idea is that if you just have a three different states for a particular genotype, you know, uh, a reference genotype, you know, homozygous reference, um, homozygous alternate allele, where both uh, alleles are alternate allele, or heterozygous, where you're in the middle. And you can imagine uh, tabulating the gene expression for any given gene relative to that gene um, genotype. And if there was an EQTL, you might see a relationship where, for instance, um, the reference allele might have a somewhat lower gene expression than the um, alternate allele. Okay? And you, you can express this. Normally, it's expressed as some form of uh, correlation. And uh, we uh, developed um, some uh, quantifications of this that are useful for thinking about uh, privacy. So one thing you can do is, while you can express the relationship as a um, correlation, it's actually better to express it in information uh, theoretic uh, terms. And so we've uh, developed this notion <coughs> of um, expressing the uh, gene expression um, relationship as a, a sort of um, conditional entropy. You know, so gi given the gene expression, uh, given that you have a particular gene expression, uh, what is your, um, your conditioned uh, entropy? And is that um, less or is, is that less or uh, more than if, if um, you didn't know the gene expression? And obviously, the uh, lower the, um, uh, the, the lower the entropy, the higher uh, predictable it is. And so we have this notion of the explanation, uh, exponentiation of this conditional entropy as a way of uh, more precisely describing how the uh, gene expression is predictable of the genotypes. And also, there's this notion that uh, not all genotypes are equal. If you know, um, say, a, a very a, a person's genotype for a fairly common SNP that, say, half the people have in the population, you know less information than if you know a person's genotype uh, for a very rare SNP. So if you, for instance, know that a person has a very rare um, variant, you know more about that person than if you know they have a particular common variant. And so we. Uh, developed this uh, notion also called uh, individual characterizing information, ICI, which is basically one over the uh, logarithm of the frequency of the genotype. So rarer genotypes uh, get uh, more characterizing information. And one of the nice things about these uh, information theoretic quantities is that you can add up the amount of uh, characterizing information, assuming the genotypes uh, between the two things that you're adding up are independent, which is always the case. But if they're independent, and if you want to see how much information is uh, leaked by uh, leaking a certain number of genotypes, you simply just add up the uh, ICI um, of uh, each of the genotypes, which is essentially adding up the number of, to some degree, is adding up the number of rare SNPs. Uh, and then what we can do with these uh, two quantities, we can ask ourselves how much information is leaked in a gene expression experiment. You know, if you know, um, um, all the EQTLs uh, in a person, you can ask, well, um, how predictable are those EQTLs and um, the underlying uh, variants related to those EQTLs, um, how characterizing, how much ICI leakage you have. And obviously, you, you tend to get the uh, more leakage you get from um, a, um, a SNP, 
you know, the Durero, the SNP, usually it becomes less predictable in terms of a predicting gene expression relationship. There's a general downward correlation, but there's a few um, EQTLs you can see that are they're both highly predictable, but yet they are also we tend to leak a lot of information. And those, of course, uh, th those uh, uh, EQTLs are ones that we would be uh, most keen to uh, kind of filter out um, to, in terms of protecting someone's privacy. And uh, we can uh, we can also ask, you know, if we find the best EQTL in a, a gene expression experiment, um, how much um, do, leakage do we have? We can say if we take the two best uh, EQTL, then we sort of add their uh, predictability together. Um, uh, you know, how much leakage do we have? We just add their uh, their uh, ICI and then their three best and so forth. And we can ask, you know, how many bits of information do we leak? And the key point is that with uh, just a few um, uh, gene expression levels that are related to EQTLs, we actually leak, leak an appreciable amount of the variant information. Uh, and this is, you know, kind of a, a theoretical idea, but we can uh, sort of practically see it, it could potentially be worrisome. And so in relation to this, we've uh, kind of developed um, a, this notion of actually exploiting this to do what's called a linking attack. And the idea here is that we have our publicly available uh, gene expression data set, that's the thing on the left, where people just put gene expression levels that we think are kind of anonymized that do not have um, variant information. Gene expression uh, data might be related to a particular condition, like having cancer or not, having HIV or not, and so forth. And we have the notion of the, um, um, that we think this information is kind of an anonymous and so forth. We have this notion if we could get a group of genotypes, maybe we could actually connect some of these genotypes up to the uh, people in the anonymized um, data set and then potentially um, uh, find out if a person had a characteristic gene expression pattern for, say, having HIV or having a particular disease. And this is fairly uh, related to this famous attack that recently happened called the Netflix attack. Um, and it's called a, it's a type of attack called a linking attack. And the basic idea in this attack is that um, in Netflix, for instance, released the um, <coughs> viewing habits of uh, many uh, individuals. Uh, you know, for instance, they had an anonymized username for these people, and they had uh, a sort of identifier of what movie they watched and a particular date. You might think of this as a very um, anonymous data set, but what people were able to show is that another uh, database, uh, IMDB, had identifiable people that viewed um, a mo uh, movies on a particular date. And you could actually by studying the dates and the, uh, the entries in this database, you could make a connection between some rows in this um, uh, the IMDB database and some um, entries in the Netflix database. Now, the key thing is there's no real private information lost in making that connection because the people have already revealed in the IMDB database that they um, have watched a particular movie at a particular date. But now you know who that anonymous individual in the Netflix data set is, so now you can see um, maybe there's another movie that person watched that didn't want to report in the IMDb database. And in this way, you by linking the two databases together, you've actually de-anonymized uh, the uh, Netflix database. And so that's actually exactly what we're doing in this um, linking attack. What we do here is we um, show how we can link these uh, two databases, the public uh, phenotype da uh, data set, which is essentially like the Netflix um, database, and then this stolen or hacked uh, genotype uh, data set, we can show how we can um, make a connection between the two. And the way we do that is through inverting uh, the EQTLs to essentially um, take the, um, the gene expression levels in the uh, public phenotype database and do genotype prediction. Now, it's a very noisy, um, uh, error-prone genotype prediction using EQTLs. But the key thing is that even though it's noisy, it's done at a fairly large scale so that we can still make some matches <coughs> with the genotype um, database. And we can still get an approximate uh, linking or connection. And once we establish that linking or connection, uh, we um, can determine which, uh, which individual, uh, say, corresponds to a particular gene expression measurement and then get the private information of what type of condition they have. Uh, and we you know, we show that you can do this with a variety of inversion strategies for the genotype prediction. You might 
not obvious how you do this, but we show you some very simple types of uh, conversions. You can do this. And I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'm just going to say we, we can demonstrate that um, uh, actually this attack will, you, you can actually um, de uh, determine the identity of a lot of the people, for instance, in the Giovanni's data set, which you already know their name, but if you didn't, you could determine it uh, fairly uh, readily with fairly uh, good sensitivity. Um, I'm going to just uh, quickly uh, skip through and just summarize what we uh, talked about. I'm going to leave out the last uh, bit of this uh, talk really quickly just so I can finish on time. So uh, what I've tried to talk to you about um, today is um, kind of what we do in uh, transcriptome um, analysis. And um, what I've uh, wanted to talk to you about is kind of the core way we analyze this activity patterns of genes going on and off um, in uh, model organisms and also uh, individuals. And the, you know, the core thing we want to do is, you know, make sense of these patterns of, of genes going on and off, very much like the lights in the buildings going on and off. And, you know, one thing we can do, of course, is clustering. That's the traditional way where things go on and off together. And I've showed you how we can develop a slightly more sophisticated clustering approach where we consistently cluster um, genes in, say, two different organisms or three different organisms to get these um, very uh, conserved modules of gene expression, say, between mean and warm and flux. We found 16 modules that we believe are very related to uh, development. And then the next thing is to try to understand, well, are the modules working independently or are they coupled to something else? And to do that, we use this notion of uh, state-space models where we try to see if we can describe the dynamics of these uh, modules kind of independently in terms of the modules themselves or do they have to be coupled. And um, so now to use the state-space models, unfortunately, they require many parameters. So we have to reduce the dimensionality of the system and think about not genes, but these kind of metagenes. And when we do that, we can uh, solve these uh, sort of state space um, equations. And uh, we can see that the, um, the gene expression uh, in these, uh, say, worm and fly or these organisms can be described in terms of not only metagenes, but these uh, sort of internal dynamic patterns. And so far, amazingly, the internal dynamic patterns in these uh, two organisms are very similar. And they're actually um, even more similar for uh, very conserved and ancient genes than they are for more recent genes. And so you get the sense that the, um, the, the, the insight that these <coughs> the conserved gene expression model modules is these internal dynamic patterns of very ancient uh, gene expression patterns, you know, canonical rise, canonical fall, canonical oscillation. And then I talk about, well, how can we interpret patterns of gene expression in terms of maybe logical models? Uh, for activity, and here I try to use this um, logic gate or, or sort of uh, type of thing which you can fit um, particular logic gates to uh, patterns of gene expression going on and off. But we can see the, the main thing we see here is that when we look at a normal uh, cellular process like the cell cycle or something, we see we have a very often very tightly controlled process that involves a lot of hand gates. Where we look at a very dysregulated process we see in disease, uh, for instance, cancer, we see it, a very different type of regulation involving many port gates. So that's the kind of picture of like, what are we doing in gene expression analysis? How do people make sense of activity patterns? And what are they doing? And then in the second part of the talk, I want to say, well, geez, you know, when they're doing this kind of basic analysis, uh, particularly when they're analyzing human samples, there, there's a kind of data exhaust. There's the identity of these people, and there's their privacy potentially uh, being compromised. And I wanted to sort of think about that. And it's a very different type of thing. And I sort of talked about a little bit of the dilemma of this uh, genomic privacy, you know, how we really want to protect patient privacy, but at the same time, we need to do uh, very large scale mining to do the thing that we talked about in the first half. And so I talked a little bit about how we think about this. And, you know, I think one of the key um, ideas is that you can't really think of it as a black and white problem. You can't have total privacy, nor can you have uh, total exposure. You really have to think about how much information is leaked. And I tried to uh, explain how you might think about that in terms of RNA-seq, you know, how much information is leaked in a gene expression experiment. And that is really leakage through these ETTLs, the relation of gene expression to variants through the ETTLs. You know, we quantify it, and I developed some metrics like this ICI or predictability to talk about that. And then I talked about practically, can you use the leaked information to kind of hack into um, 
um, public gene expression data set, you know, so data set that's public, can use this small amount of uh, leaked information to potentially identify people. And I show actually um, Mason can do that in the framework of a leak and data pack. Uh, so with that, I think I'll uh, conclude. I didn't talk about that last thing I was maybe going to talk about, which is the publication patterns, but I think that was enough for today. And I'll just conclude by um, acknowledging the people that uh, worked on this. So the um, the uh, most of the gene expression dynamics was really done by two um, individuals in my lab, um, Dai Feng uh, Wang and Gun Fu Yan. So Dai Feng uh, worked on the um, DRESS, which is the states-based models, and the low regic for logic uh, gates. He led those analyses. And Kun Fu uh, worked on uh, Kun Fu Yan worked on the uh, clustering, the orthoclust, and I have some URLs I list up there. And the uh, privacy analysis and was really led by another associate research scientist, um, Arif Harmanchi, uh, who developed this um, kind of EQGL emotion for us. And I list them uh, URLs there and so forth. And I appreciate uh, your attention. And I'll, I'll take, take questions after that. Uh, I'm done. Thank you, Dr. Gerson, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the second button, on the send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, do you think that issues of genomic privacy will be a practical major impediment of research in the future? I do think this is a very big, um, do this is a very big I, 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 do, I do think this is a very big issue. Um, you know, because of course, the promise of um, genomics is that we're going to be doing this on a very, uh, very, very large scale over, you know, potentially millions of people or uh, a large a chunk of the uh, population, and to, uh, of course, get the full value of genomics, which is really uh, to do with a lot of statistical things. We have to aggregate all this data together and come up with uh, ge more general um, conclusions from it. And I think everyone agrees that that's the uh, promise, but of course, to do that appropriately, we have to <coughs> assure the individuals that are uh, donating their data that uh, their privacy is protected and that the aggregation of all of this information <coughs> will not compromise their uh, privacy. Uh, and so I think this, and, and you know, it, m it maybe seems obvious to say, well, we'll you know, encrypt the data or we'll keep it on the computer systems. But what I've tried to show today is that it's actually um, much more subtle. And, you know, as we found out repeatedly with very large data sets, there's subtle ways these data sets uh, leak information. And we have to, um, Think about this carefully when we release uh, large amounts of information and uh, really develop formalism for measuring in, um, information leakage. Uh, okay, we have time for one more question. Do you think the transcriptional modules are associated with certain characteristic types of logical gates? Good question. It's uh, something we haven't. Um, uh, that, that's a, a, a good question. It, it's something we uh, haven't completely uh, worked through. But um, you know, we're, we're very interested in those particular types of modules that we've shown that, um, for instance, the genes go up and down in a coordinated way in say uh, two different organisms. You know, they're associated with different um, characteristic internal dynamics and they're. Uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't uh, focus on de in detail, but they also tend to be associated with maybe different functions. And it'd be very interesting to see if they were, um, <clears throat> they had a fundamentally different regulatory structure. You know, maybe one is more um, uh, uh, coupled than, uh, you know, the, with, more regulated by, say, hand gates than another one, which has more OR gates. And we haven't been able to disentangle this, but that this is something that we would see as a, a direction to go in. 
I would like to once again thank Dr. Mark Gerstein for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 11, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know that when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again. Goodbye.